Yeah, yeah, he did it. Gavin, did you forget the I picture? always thought he was doing it by accident, but I thought no. he might not be doing it on purpose. Uh, Gavin, did, well, did you, yeah. Well, do you got to study? You got to study to prove that that he did that. Uh, <laughs> no, you didn't see it, I mean, Mr. Parker. Are are you Godless Galaxy from a, like a, yeah. a year ago? What's that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's it's good to see you guys. So have you have you figured out a solution to uh, genetic degeneration, mutation accumulation yet? Have you have you looked into it? It's been a couple of years now, so. Yeah, I haven't really much looked into it because I think <sighs> you guys are just lying about it and whatnot. Oh, just lying about. Okay. okay. Yeah, but not oh. even looking at it. Yeah. I I've looked into it. I'm and and, and what did you find? Have you discovered any type of? Uh, selective I, mechanism that, that can remove these mutations that are uh, effectively neutral? I mean, when I read the studies you give me, they usually not tell me what you're telling me. Can Is you provide any, um, can you provide an example of a study I've given you that you, um, um, that I misrepresented off the top of your head? Uh, modern day debate. I asked you for a study about genetic um, destruction or whatever, and you give me one. It talks about the Y chromosome like you said, um, the whole, like, this is the rate of decay for the genome. And then the study you give me was about um, the Y chromosome. And even that was just very strange. And I'm like, this this doesn't even talk about anything about degrading. It only talks about the Y chromosome. And then your response was, um, that's only a bigger problem for you. And I'm like, but, like, your study doesn't do anything. Let me okay, so two questions. So two questions. Do you disagree with with the fact that we accumulate roughly 60 to 100 de novo mutations per person per generation? Do you disagree with that? I don't really trust you, so I, I sure, maybe they are. Well, this is just kind of generally known. I mean, I've debated PhDs on this where they recognize that, that fact. I can pull up a source just to show you on that, uh, just to show you proof on that. And would you disagree that the Y chromosome is uh, accumulating mutations quite rapidly now. It's, it's a fast mutating um, DNA compartment. Would you disagree with that? I mean, I would have to see evidence showing that it's rapidly like degrading. <clears throat> Did you know that the Y chromosome in humans and the Y chromosome in chimpanzees is less than 70% dissimilar? No. You're not familiar with, uh, have you done much study in the last couple of years? No, I've been mostly focusing on um, policy, like politics and um, physics, not biology and genetics. So if, if we're just uh, dumb, uninformed creationists who make our living lying, how do you explain the fact that chimpanzees who are supposed to be our closest cousin, right, we split from a common ancestor with the chimpanzee roughly 6 million years ago. Um, how do you explain the fact that our Y chromosomes, which are essentially non-recombining DNA, they should generally be quite stable. Um, how do you explain the fact that it's, it's so different? Less than 70% dissimilar if you consider overall architecture over, and I'm gonna pull up the paper just to show you. Okay. Um, just so you don't think I'm lying or anything, but, um, while I'm pulling it up, how would you, at the top of your head, I guess using some critical thinking skills, how would you explain such massive, massive dissimilarity between our, apparently our closest cousin? Um, well, it would, okay, I think the problem would be to figure out how we're assessing the overall um, genome of the Y chromosome itself and like how we're determining it being degrading. Because I'm not I, saying, I, I mean, there has to be a ahead. widespread study about the Y chromosome in multiple people to assess that it is degrading at a certain rate. So right here, are you familiar with this paper? Chimpanzee and human Y chromosomes are remarkably divergent in structure and gene content. This is coming from a secular, secular source right down here. More than 30% of the chimp Y chromosome lacks an alignable counterpart on the human Y chromosome and vice versa. Page's team found that chimp Y chromosome has only two thirds as many distinct genes or gene families as the human Y chromosome and only 47% as many protein coding elements. So when you actually consider all 
size differences, architecture, gene content. It's less than 35% dissimilar um, Y chromosome. I'm going to have to look at the study exactly because that's just you pulling stuff from it. So, Well, they've had further studies where they've come up with solutions. For example, some evolutionists are saying that the Y chromosome is rapidly changing, rapidly evolving. That's why it's been able to accumulate so much differences in that time frame since the split would you say that that's a valid explanation i mean it's a possibility i don't know genetics that well but here's the thing you said i was a liar to say that the y chromosome is rapidly accumulating mutations apparently by the source i provided you so now you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because in order to explain the differences okay go ahead no go ahead the study you gave me was about um a study about a, a family in china or something and like it was studying the Y chromosomes between a father, his grandfather, and his like uncle and cousin or whatever. And I'm like, this isn't really that conclusive about things. Um, I believe that was a Y chromosome pedigree study in Icelanders, I believe. Maybe. Right. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. These are things you, you should consider, Mr. Parker. If you're going to hold to universal common ancestry... Okay, then you're going to need to deal with the problem of mutation accumulation. The fact that population geneticists do acknowledge that mutations are accumulating far too quickly for selection to filter out such mutations. This is recognized. So when you just say creationists are liars, you clearly are not up to date with the literature or else population geneticists wouldn't be coming up with mechanisms such as synergistic epistasis mutation count mechanism because if genetic entropy doesn't exist or there's no problem then why are population geneticists who aren't young earth creationists why are they putting forth models to explain away the problem or to solve the problem that you say doesn't exist and two Excellent. and two you are going to have to explain if you believe that humans and chimpanzees are related through common ancestry you are going to explain why their Y chromosomes are so vastly different, less than 35% <laughs> dissimilar. And apparently the chimpanzee is, is our closest cousin. So my point is these are questions you're gonna to have to deal with, questions you're gonna to have to answer if, if these are the beliefs and the, mo the model ultimately of universal common ancestry that, that you hold to. So I would just say lo look into it at least. I was going to point out, SFT, did you guys know that Iceland still has a state church? Really? Yeah. Everybody t keeps telling me Iceland and, and uh, Norway, all these places that have these wonderful secular, you know, socialist, whatever. There's still theocracy today. <laughs> hey, hey, Parker, I, I have a question for you. Can you see the live chat? If I post a link in there right now, would you be able to get it? Yeah. All right, take it. I just put a link in the live chat on YouTube. Just click on that real quick and let me know if you see it. Can you open that link? Yeah, I can open it, but there's um hold on. And so where where does that link to? That's not a creation source, right? Okay. That link to a bunch of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's nih.gov. Yeah. And do you see what it says if you scroll down just a tiny bit? It says those are all genetic diseases and they're all in alphabetical order you. for you. <laughs> and you can scroll right on down that long list. And I'm just wondering because they're adding to this list regularly. And so if natural selection works and the human <laughs> genome is not breaking down, then how do you explain this growing long list? That's a fair question. So if you want to deny genetic entropy or genomic degradation, then can you just respond to that? And, and I just want to point out one thing before you do, Mr. Parker, and do so, take as much time as you need. Don't read through the source like this guy on the screen. Because oftentimes this is how evolutionists <laughs> read through sources and citations that, that we provide them, especially creationist papers. Um, they make the mistake. It's a very, very bad mistake of uh, putting a blindfold over their eyes w when they read these papers. So that could be why they're coming to the, the, the incorrect conclusion. So just make sure, Mr. Parker. Anyways, yeah, how would you explain the, the rapid accumulation of new genetic-related diseases every single year being added 
to the genetic database um, that Sam pointed to. Okay, so right. I'm, cur I'm currently looking at the one study you put it in your presentation you showed me. Well, what about um, the one that I posted? Because that one's that. not, that's I'm that's down. one that everyone can understand. I'm, I'm getting to that. Oh, okay. Um, the explanation for this is that as science develops and we're able to learn and assess different um, um, genetic problems, we're able to discover and route to um, too many common diseases we find today. Um, so that's, I, just, that's just more disease. Like, it's not so like, oh, more, shoot, so this like, new kid, this new kid, like this b newborn kid just has Wait. a... Parker, back up. I'm not trying to interrupt you. I just want to clarify. So you just literally said the new genetic diseases that we're finding today. Those are new diseases. Yes. You understand? Like the, so that we're adding. Like it's not like it's not like new in the sense like, oh, it no, just, they are. It was what do you mean? They are. They are new. Like that we are finding new diseases regularly adding to that list currently. There's between six and seven thousand genetic related. I had a link. I just it, it's they took it down from the World Health Organization that said ten thousand. So the only link that I can provide right now on the spot is one that says six to seven thousand. So that's fine. But you, so now you have six to seven thousand genetic related diseases, and they're growing. The list is growing, just as you said. So I'm is, so is I'm asking because, you how is that because of science developing and assessing that these are. Um, well, let me ask you this. Are, do we have medicine? Are we making medical advances too? So yeah. not, not only are the list of diseases growing, what would happen if we were to lose medical, human medical intervention? What would happen? Would we be better off or worse off? Do you understand my question? It's really simple. Like if we didn't have medicine, what would, what would happen to us? You know, we wouldn't... Um, I mean, you know, millions of people will die due to um, medicine, like due to what? No, 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 no. The, me the medicine, the medicine does, is not the, the problem. The medicine is part of the solution. What's the problem? The problem is what? Genetics, I guess, or in like the other diseases, diseases that exist in the world. So you just but, totally... but so how do you deny these diseases and this accumulation of diseases? How, how do you but deny the human genome you're, you're of breaking trying, down, but then to, then acknowledge it? You're trying to assess the idea that all these genetic diseases must be fatal. If they're extremely fatal, no, 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 no. They don't have to be fatal. Fatal. Okay, so then, then what's the exact? Do they have to be fa fatal? Why do they have to be fatal? I mean, can we just... I mean, you're making it sound like without, um, you know, like in a couple of years without medicine, we would all die. That's what I'm getting the gist of a little bit from you. That's where well, I, what's, you I guess you can define a couple of years, but let's say we removed medicine right now. What would happen? <clears throat> um, people want to get their medicine like insulin and would die. Um, and wh why do they need insulin? Because they have diabetes. And what's that a result of? Um... It's genetic kind of, entropy. No, it's no. complex factors. Um, well, how, how, how can you how can you look at this list of genetic? They are it literally says right on it, genetic related diseases. That's growing. How can you look at that list and still be? Would you genetic? agree? Would you agree, um, Mr. Parker, Mr. Peter Parker? Would you admit? <laughs> that these genetic related diseases due to mutations are due to mutations. Yes. Okay. But yeah, you want to say that mutations are the destroyer and I'm going to bury your point right here. So if you just did a little bit of research, the human germline mutation rate, are you familiar with who Michael Lynch is? Not a, not a young earth creationist. No, I'm, I'm not. Like, like okay, I said well, earlier, I'm more interested in politics and physics, not genetics. So yeah, you're know. the one who accused. Yeah, but you're the one who accused me of lying earlier. So here we go. Uh, de novo mutations. On average, newborns contain 100 de novo mutations. See, here's why when I typically debate informed evolutionists, they don't waste time. Okay. Asking for studies on things that are just generally well known and accepted now uh you know typically bogs down the uh the discussion but here's the thing okay so here's the source um roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation you can find other ones that 
Um, and it even says here, although the human germline mutation rate is higher than that in any other well-studied species. And then you can read through it and find out about effective population size, effective genome size. But here's the thing, the mutation, the, the disease database that Sam is showing you, you would agree that those are due to mutations. And the whole point of genetic entropy is basically that mutations are accumulating far too quickly and in far too many for selection to be able to filter out those mutations. And if we can now agree, now that I've showed you the source, that we accumulate roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation, most of those, most of those being what population geneticists consider effectively neutral, too subtle to the organism's phenotype and genotype to be selected for or against, they build up from generation to generation. And that's why we have currently, okay, genetic entropy on so many levels, all these mutation related diseases. Now we see epigenetic as well related genetic degeneration. I mean, autism clearly has a genetic component, cancer skyrocketing, immunological disorders, autoimmune diseases. Uh, cancer is what, one in three now? I mean, these things can't be denied, most of them being mutation related. So it's the basic question. Trouble. So Mr. Parker, just take as much time as you need now that you've seen that we accumulate roughly 100 new mutations. Sam provided you a wonderful source about how mutations impact our genetics, especially when it comes to disease, you know, it breaks us down. It's the destroyer, not the creator. So how do you, uh, how do you solve this problem? What's your answer to it ultimately, Mr. Parker? Well, and especially given in light, we don't have any positive evidence of mutations creating new species. Right. Boom, N another good point. So how would you address that, uh, Mr. Parker? So, the whole point of me bringing up the idea that, you know, medicine and science is discovering new um, diseases is that we're um, calibrating our assessment of what qualifies as disease and going over things that we didn't discover earlier. So, I mean, Baba Bowie. No, that's not right? accurate, Parker. It's what not mean? that we didn't discover them earlier. It's that people are getting diseases and they need medicine to keep them alive. It's not like, oh, wow, it's, I didn't realize this. The rate of like getting they would cancer, have died. Okay, if we have like a graph of the diagnosis of cancer patients, is that similar to that to that of the advancement of technology in assessing cancer? Or Jake, uh, cancer? Parker, look at that list. It's not just cancer. But I, I know, but like, like it, it's, it's what, would you agree cool. that, would you agree that we are making new um, scientific equipment that can identify these new diseases. Mr. Parker, okay. Why do we need to identify the disease? The, 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 the diseases is the point. And the diseases are on the rise. So for example, okay, however many years ago, 50 years ago, autism, for example, or a lot of these autoimmune diseases, they were like one in 50. Now it's like one in because we were under able to 10. Identify it much easier. Yeah, exactly. And that's your argument. But here's the thing. That's false. I, no, I'm going to tell you why it's false. It's false because if that's the case, okay, and it's truly mm -hmm. always been one in a few, one in 10, whatever the number is now, yes. um, one in 50 autism used to be way more rare, but you're saying that now they're identifying it better. Where's all the 50, 60, 70 year old autistic people walking around or 50, 60, 70 year old people walking around with all these undiagnosed autoimmune diseases that you say have just gone undetected all of these years. I mean, that, okay, that's, that's a hard thing to, for me to pull out right now. Um, I would say, so you're asking me like why we don't find old people with autism? Like older well, if, if supposedly it's, it's always been this common, then we should be seeing a lot more people, especially of the older generation, walking around with this, now suddenly diagnosed with it. Okay, Especially since so, autism is generally diagnosed in, at birth or near birth. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Yeah. So um, where... I mean, I don't know the exact study on um, old people getting tested for autism or getting medical assessments of that, um, like, especially older generations. Because, I mean, if we go back... Um, you know, in the 60s or whatever, and check out how they assess um, people with autism. It would be the more, more obvious um, characteristics of autism on the 
on the on the other ends of the spectrums that are quite distinguishable. And nowadays we know it's a spectrum, and so there's a very wide range. And I would find it hard to believe that with this new discovery that a lot of older people are going out of the way to get these assessments to see if they have um, if they're on the spectrum. Like if if you can show me a graph of older people having I don't know. I, I think you guys are just trying to like say like, well actually if we just completely avoid your point about, you know, science new science being invented assessing different standards of things, then yeah, our point makes perfect sense. But like if um say our science wasn't let's say our science was fifty percent effective at identifying a certain disease. Um and then in 50 years, we we're able to make it 100% effective in determining this disease. You would expect there to be a lot less cases now than in the future, because you would have better assessment of that disease. Correct? I got a website I'm trying to share if, you, if this helps. Oh, yeah. Here, one sec. Is in the Go ahead, Joel. True. Yeah, this is just fairly recent. Oh. I'm going to so, full screen there. It's showing part of your point, Mr. Parker, how there are an increase of sites reporting, but even with when they become kind of static, I guess in the last decade or so, we're still seeing an increase in autism. Oh yeah, look at that, one in 50. Now, what's that, uh, Joel? One in 54 down at, yeah, mm -hmm. I see one in 50. So even though the sites are, are stabilizing, num the number of testing going on in the, in the spectrum like, that you were describing, we're still seeing an increase in autism rates. Well, let me ask you a question, Mr. Parker. We, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, geneticist Dr. John Sanford, who recently spoke at NIH, National Institute for Health, on human, human genetic degeneration, okay? And the National Institute of Health is not a young earth creationist organization. I think you knew that. And he spoke a great deal about the problems associated with mutation accumulation and the increase in mutation-related diseases that we're now seeing, you know, it's, it's a pandemic. It's, it's genetic degeneration on all levels, even epigenetic he was talking about. And this is a burden and a problem that people at the NIH are looking to find solutions for. And, but here's the point, you, you seem to be denying this. I mean, have you watched that lecture recently? Are you up to date on all of this? Um, if, if was, what you're saying would... here is just not accepted. It's just not demonstrable. I mean, diseases are on the rise. That's And here's the thing. Any new diseases that they're now better able to detect due to medical advancement only adds even more that aren't undetected. Every single year. Everybody knows a person who has a problem that they go to the doctor for and the doctor can't figure it out. Everybody... Yeah. <laughs> I, I think a lot of a lot of a lot of a lot of these people are older i know about my friend's mom she was on antidepressants for a long time i think a lot of these antidepressants can cause brain damage i know for a fact like um it seems like well, i don't know for a fact but i mean like a, a majority of people that i know that have family members that have uh um are dealing with any kind of problems with their brain right now, or either, either on um, like anti-anxiety meds or, yeah. or um, SSR, you know what I mean? Because um, it just seems to be pretty, I've, I've did a, like uh, just a local study on like, I've seen a rise in brain cancer too. And um, I make my uh, uncle, his uh, um, high school sweetheart died. And then his uh, um, mother of his daughter died like within a few days of each other, brain cancer. And then like a, a week later, my buddy, um, his, mom died of brain cancer and just like it's just like my sister my brother-in-law's sister died of brain cancer this is all in the same year man it's just like brain cancer brain cancer brain cancer and i look i don't see like anything going up in the studies but it's like i don't know if it's caught up yet because like these people are dying fast and, yeah um, and, and that being said great point chris alzheimer's dementia these are on the rise mm -hmm. okay people describe it as a pandemic and tropic degeneration on all levels asthma Immune diseases, cancers, immunological diseases, yeah, this is, uh, brain this. disorders, like uh, Chris is saying, and a lot of it's environmental related, right? Yeah, they typically sure. say that um, genetics plus environment equals phenotype because environment has a huge part to play in it. Mm -hmm. People that are smoking or a lot of these drugs, you know, they can result in disease 
defects in our genetics that can also be passed on to and, and switch on like that. epigenetics switch switch on you know switch on some of these things that that's right you know, you know that so so how do you deal with all of that mr uh I mean, peter I, parker i mean i would have to like you know do more research but i'm just generally making the idea that i i personally don't believe you guys are being honest about your um that's not a goal Huh? Well, Mr. Parker, you just said that I wasn't being honest about the hundred new mutations per person per generation. And I just showed you a source no, from Michael I'm Lynch sure. himself. His name is population geneticist, a leading population geneticist. And even he's acknowledging that he's a human liar. genetic regeneration. Well, you but I'm a liar, like, apparently. Yeah, I'm just studying you, you you call him a liar? Or, uh, Mr. So, Parker. I just pulled up a... Oh. I just pulled up I just pulled up something. Uh, Mr. Parker, so read this. Okay, so now that I showed you from the source itself, deal with this. A new paper, Lynch 2016, that's the one I showed you, written by a leading population geneticist, shows that the human genetic degeneration is a very serious problem. He affirms that the human germline mutation rate is roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation. I'm not making this stuff up. While the somatic mutation rate is roughly three new mutations per person per generation. Lynch estimates human fitness is declining one to 5% per generation. And he adds, most mutations have minor effects. Remember when I was saying that? Most mutations are too subtle to fitness, that they are only affected by what? Genetic drift. Selection can't see them, which means selection can't do anything about them, can't remove them. So here we go, most mutations have minor effects. Very few have lethal consequences. Yeah, selection's gonna get rid of the worst. We agree with that. And even fewer are beneficial coming from a leading population geneticist. So this is the data, Mr. Parker. How do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? Other than saying that we're just lying. I mean, the data's here. Yeah, and the data's so, showing so that the so-called okay. neut neutral mutations are really not neutral, you know what I mean? <laughs> the, paper, the papers are lying, everyone. It's creationist whole me. We, we just no, made I up those paper, bro. <laughs> have to read this paper, <laughs> Please don't Guys, guys, guys let's, give, let's give Mr. Parker uh, equal time to, to make his case. True, I'm going to say screen true. share. Mr. Parker, you, it's right here. You can read it. I've already showed you the source. Yeah, okay. Uh, the I Lynch mean, source. Like right As your now. attorney, though, I advise you that you can always invoke your right to not fall for that trap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can pull a Todd and just say that you don't want to fall for that trap. But so here's the thing: I'm what not type of that trap? So, so what type of selection, Mr. Parker? And then we're just going to be silent and let you deal with it. Which type of selection can remove those mutations that, as as is stated here, have such minor effects, like a typographical error in a text? They can't be seen by selection, and they and they accumulate. They're passed on from generation to generation. Um, go ahead. What, what's your solution to this? I would have to do more reading on the studies that you're pre you're presenting to me and assess if what you're stating about them is true. And then um, I would have to do more research about genetics in general. I mostly read um, politics and physics. I don't do much genetic reading. I haven't done any in quite a while. So, like, I mean, I, I understand some of what you're talking about, but, like, I don't have any of the research done exactly because I didn't come here, like, with 50 papers ready to, like, argue this against you. I was more I was more intrigued about what Joel and uh, the guy with the um, ape profile said about um, homosexuality. So yeah, it's uh, uh, real quick. It's not uh, it's not an ape profile. It's my grandpa. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was a monkey. Yeah, aren't you aren't you related to the chimpanzees and what? pine trees, bananas? You see, I personally believe I come from a kangaroo. I, I, I don't believe I evolved it from a monkey. And well, I just want to point out, too, for argument's sake, because uh, Mr. Parker, I wouldn't, you know, um, I wouldn't bombard you with these things if we did not have several debates on this, because your, your YouTube name used to be Godless Galaxy. We debated on Modern Day Debate, yeah. and you, you, you kind of doubled down and went into full damage control mode. Uh, after those debates, saying that my sources are not saying what I'm saying they're saying, or I'm lying, kind of as you said here. But as we can see, this is typical of the evolutionists where I guess they're just not interested to, because I think when, when you do, as an evolutionist, when you do go uh, further study this, this data, like we're suggesting, that's when you're going to realize like, wow, 
you know, I'm really not related to a banana plant. But here's the thing. A lot of evolutionists, they don't want to go down that deep because then it's going to it's going to hurt your worldview and it's going to force you to reconsider your position of, of bananas and whale, whales being related. So, you know, it, so you've had, I mean, a year or two to, to look into it. And you said you haven't. And that's fine. But that's typical of the evolutionists. You know, they get demolished in debate and then they don't go <laughs> well, prove themselves, I guess. But yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Well, after the debates, I really didn't interact with you after those, really. And I, I did a little bit more research, but like, I didn't really care that much because I went into physics more more or less because um, of the flood or whatever. But like, I mean, and then I delve into some other subject. It's been over, it's been more than a year, I think. So like, yeah, I've, I've had, you know, my own, I've been doing my own thing for quite a while. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. But it, here's the thing. You know, one of the most important questions that everybody should have is, is where did we come from? You know, there's, it's either created or evolved. Now, the data, the empirical data that we talk about, modern scientific data shows that, no, we could not have evolved in the sense of universal common ancestry, right, from a single-celled ancestor to a multi-celled ancestor to a fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal, monkey, 